we're going to vote on the uh, superintendent's recommendation on Oakley Green April 5th. Um, we're having a, a listening session tonight. The board will vote on the superintendent's recommendations around boundary changes for the Lincoln Wilson cluster for 2016 17 at the April 12th meeting. Um, we uh, will also have a second public hearing on April 5th from uh, 5 to 7 p.m. Uh, everybody, since we want to hear everybody tonight, um, everybody will be given two minutes. Um, we're going to cycle through the schools um, and continue cycling through uh, until the end of the uh, end of the hearing. So, um, with that. If people uh, come late, they can still come on at the end even if they're not from the school. In other words, if somebody from uh, uh, Bridal Mile came in late, yeah, they then, still then talk they should end. talk to um, Roseanne right there. Um, child care is being provided uh, in the Windows conference room on the second floor. Um, we have interpreters with us tonight. I'd like to invite them up at this time to introduce themselves and indicate where they'll be. Okay, thank you. Um, this meeting will be recorded and will be posted on the PPS Grows website. So uh, with that, Ms. Susan, would you like to announce our first two speakers? Our first two speakers are Lori lyons Lockman and Gabrielle Mercedes Boulevard. My name is Gabrielle Mercedes Bolivar, and I'm in the Jefferson Cluster, a parent of a first, sixth, and seventh grader at Chief Joseph Ackley Green Split Campus. Thank you very much for having me tonight. I appreciate that you are going to vote on April 5th to support uh, Ackley Green Middle School in 2016 reopening. I would also like to request that you at that time vote to reopen Harriet Tubman. We are in this together. We do not want to leave our students behind. Harriet Tubman and Ockley Green Middle School were both created as middle schools as part of a desegregation plan so we would not continue to concentrate poverty. When both of these schools were closed, this led to a reconcentration of poverty and segregation in our schools. As the data has shown that DBRAC has done over the last 18 months, as we as a cluster have done in our visioning statements, as you heard at Ockley Green when we had 500 people pack the school to share their visioning and supporting both Harriet Tubman and Ockley Green, the time is now. This is a sense of urgency. We have experienced our schools closed one after another, most recently in 2012 when Harriet Tubman, um, Young Women's Leadership Academy, and Humboldt were both closed very quickly, displacing our students. There's a difference between displacement and disruption. Displacement is when you take away what a student has. We all experience disruption in our lives as we have transition, and that's a natural part of our life. But what we need to remember is that we are asking now for our students to have this opportunity so that they can have access to parity in um, educational opportunities that they currently don't have. Thank you. Thank you. And just to add, the, I'm Lori lyons lockman and just to add um, regarding Tubman in 2017-18, we just want to make sure that the kids in our cluster, especially Boise, Elliott, Humboldt, and King have the opportunity that the rest of our schools have. And so I just, and we are here to partner with you to make sure that that goes forward as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Jenny Staub and Laura Burchard. Can you guys hear the testimony out there? <clears throat> Could you raise your hand if you can hear the testimony? Okay, thank you. people are going to be together after her. Perfect. Welcome. You can go to it together after. Hi, um, my name is Laura Burchard and I'm, right over there. I'm a Metropolitan Learning Center parent um, of a kindergartner, third grader, and currently sixth grader. And um, I'm here basically to ask on behalf of um, myself as a parent if um, we could have a little bit more information about the focus option review referenced on page 22 of um, this document. 
Um, we'd like to know basically um, when this process begins, um, what the public comment process is, what our, we'd like to participate. We really, as a community, would like to um, be involved in this process. Um, we're open to a lot of options. One thing that we don't really like and can't really live with is moving to a K, or losing our K-12. We feel that our school is um, like any ecosystem, you know, you kill the frogs and um, next thing you know, it's uh, the end of the world. So we don't want to lose any of our kids. Um, no kid is expendable in our community. We'd also like to invite um, Superintendent Carol Smith and any board members to our high school um, seniors and sophomores um, portfolio review. This process is um, amazing. It's a unique opportunity for our students um, where the students present their work um, much like you would in a thesis uh, defense or presentation. And um, I think it would mean a lot to our students to have our school board members and our superintendent participate in that. Um, so I believe I've uh, spoken my part. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you. The next two speakers are sharing two minutes. Sorry about the confusion. Sorry about that. No, welcome. Right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to advocate for Hayhurst. My name is Jenny Steyer. This is Tina Oliver. We have current students at Hayhurst, and we both also have younger kids. So we'll be around at Hayhurst for another eight to nine years, and we're very much interested in both the short and the long-term fate of Hayhurst. Tonight, we have one major piece of feedback to the board concerning Superdent Smith's scenario, which is we need more kids. We're grateful for the relief from overcrowding this fall with Odyssey's relocation, but the slight boundary adjustments do not go far enough to address the subsequent under-enrollment. Our program will still be at risk of being stripped down to the bare minimum. Given our demographics in our neighborhood, here students will be disproportionately affected by this loss of educational programming and potentially higher class sizes. Here, yes, current population includes a percentage of low-income kids that is two to three times that of our neighboring schools. This brings diversity and the richness of ex experience that we value. It also brings fewer financial resources in the community and greater need, which makes, it, which makes adequate funding via healthy enrollment particularly critical for Hayhurst. According to the implementation analysis, Hayhurst will, for years, remain the school with the lowest enrollment in our area as well as by far the lowest facility <coughs> utilization. We are left undersized while our neighboring schools are at or well above capacity. Current projections shift about 50 kids to Hayhurst, but this not even, does not even take into account grandfathering. It is likely that with grandfathering, the actual number is quite small, maybe a handful. We will do our best to attract current families interested in transferring from neighboring schools, but the education opportunities of our children cannot rest on a scenario based on hope alone. And so tonight, to the board, we respectfully ask two things. Number one, make a solid plan to ultimately right-size Hayhurst and to increase our enrollment by assigning additional areas to our catchment from Bridal Mile, Maplewood, and Riki. Number two, develop and publish a plan for how to sustain Hayhurst's current enrichment programming in the event that we are under-enrolled due to grandfathering. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Helena Raposo. And Katrina Goddard. <coughs> Welcome. Hi. Um, can I start? Yeah. Thank you for having me here. Um, my name is Lena Raposo. I'm in 11th grade at Lincoln High School. And um, I would like to request um, for um, the change in the barn boundaries from Lincoln High School to Wilson to change because right now um, me and my family we um, we recently moved to this neighborhood we're in and with the objective of me and my brother and sister for going to um, the IB program at Lincoln High School and with the change in the boundary um, it would not be possible for them to go to the same school as I am right now and have the opportunity to have, um, to be part of the IB program. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Katrina Goddard, and I'm a parent with a ninth grader at Lincoln High School and a sixth grader at West Sylvan. And I'm representing a neighborhood that I'll call the Hewitt Humphrey neighborhood, which is part of the north of Patton region in Bridal Mile. And our concern uh, for this neighborhood is the transportation issues if we were to uh, send our students to Wilson rather than to Lincoln. And I handed out uh, an email that I sent to you last night as well, which um, shows that the students in our area, which live on the western half of Humphrey Boulevard, the western half of Hewitt, and the roads that lead from um, those roads, take the number 58 bus and would go downtown past Lincoln and come back out through um, to Wilson and take over an hour to get to school. And I think you've already heard a lot about that issue with the West Slope area and we wanted to mention that this is the same concern for the students in our region. Um, I looked through the student directories of both Bridal Mile and West Sylvan in order to get a sense of how many students this represents and I found 11 students in grades 1 through 8 so this is a very small number of students I don't think it would be a big impact regardless of which um, school they were enrolled in in terms of the um, enrollment distribution and I also note that the eastern half of Hewitt and of uh, Humphrey are in the Ainsworth district and so our streets in our neighborhood are divided uh, down the middle into two different enrollment areas. And so our area, um, speaking with other parents in this area by email over the past two days, um, we have thought of two different possible solutions. One is the same solution that was proposed for the West Slope area um, so that our students would continue to go to Lincoln after uh, they attend West Sylvan. And the other possibility would be to um, move these students to the Ainsworth district so that the streets that we live on would all be within the same enrollment area. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Stephanie Yao Long and Stephen Chen. <coughs> Good evening. Thank you for your time and consideration. My name is Stephanie and I live in this beautiful neighborhood sandwiched between Burnside and Highway 26, Washington County and Washington Park. It's called Sylvan Highlands. Each boundary scenario has introduced a new fate and therefore new waves of questions. In the first scenario, half of our neighborhood went to Bridal Mile, half to Chapman. In the second scenario, we were all back at Chapman. In 2B, we were all at Ainsworth. And in the superintendent scenario, half of us are now at Bridal Mile and the other half are at Ainsworth. Um, by the way, we deeply appreciate your consideration of our high school transportation needs in staying with Lincoln. All of this has brought into sharp focus what I value in a community. After myriad discussions and emails with friends and people, I've never met face to face. I embrace Chapman as my tribe. We listen, we're passionate, and we respectfully disagree. That is why I would ask you to allow my neighborhood to remain in Chapman's catchment for now. Let the dust settle after long-term solutions are fully vetted or else we will be back on the chopping block. Will some of us be grandfathered at Chapman and then Bridal Mile when suddenly we will be brought back to Ainsworth when hopefully a new downtown school opens? I personally support the Ramona option. I am willing to gamble on my younger son's kindergarten experience to stay at Chapman. <coughs> I can tell you Chapman is fractured. I have spoken to equal amounts pro and anti Ramona. And that makes me wonder why the school that is limping along already with band-aids and crutches is suffering the most. I have two thoughts. Okay, I have more than that, but I'll start with two. Um, Utilize rented office space for focus option and alternative programs. They can be centrally located. There are some beautiful new developments on the east side and the west side to choose from. Oh. Help pay for this with fees. I willingly paid $400 a month for full day kindergarten at an overcrowded neighborhood school. It would be worth every penny having capped class sizes and that special instruction that often programs afford. 
And finally, I would ask for neighborhood preference at Odyssey for Sylvan Highlands. Um, please prioritize neighborhood kids. Thank you. My name is Stephen Shen, and I'm representing the views of Hainsworth Spanish Immersion. Superintendent Smith's recommendation for the west side is a creative one that improves educational outcomes over previous proposals. Instead of impacting 1,307 students while opening with fewer than two classrooms at Chapman and leaving Brydamel, Hayhurst, and Ainsworth under-enrolled, this proposal affects 541 and opens five classrooms at Chapman. It's a great step in the right direction, but it only begins to address years of deferred planning. The approach for Bridal Mile can still be improved. While the recommendations resolve transportation issues for some of Bridal Mile, students in the neighborhood north of Patton use the same transit route and will still have the longest public transit commute to their assigned high school in the district. Dual assignment for both Bridal Mile and Ainsworth to Lincoln and Wilson would work much more cleanly than these hard boundaries. This year, approximately 40% of Bridal Mile's fifth grade classes voluntary petition for Gray, and approximately 75% of all Bridal Mile students who choose Gray go on to Wilson. Dual assignment could be instituted immediately and would more evenly enroll both Lincoln and Wilson. We also applaud the idea of establishing a Wilson cluster immersion program. If an immersion program is cited at Smith, early seating for Smith could be done at Hayhurst, and the program could be moved to Smith with two strands of K through two. Along with open transfers from Maplewood, Hayhurst would be right sites for fall of 2016, and Smith would be more fully programmed when it finally opens. If Hayhurst isn't used as a bridge for Smith immersion, please consider greater boundary changes and bridge funding for Hayhurst until enrollment gets above 400 students so that Hayhurst can maintain their programming. Ramona was an idea generated by Chapman parents, improves the walkability for their most vulnerable population, and offers the newest room for the district specifically designed for early learners. As an interim step, it's okay. Ramona keeps Chapman neighborhood students in Chapman's neighborhood. But uh, as a bridge to a long-term solu so solution, we must realize that there, uh, Excuse me. As a bridge to a long-term solution, the recommendation addresses many conclusions, concerns. But please realize that while this is a reasonable first step, we still need a long-term solution that must involve citing a new West Side Elementary and Middle School in the near future. This is a reality we cannot ignore, and we requires our continued attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, our next two speakers, Heidi Barker and Carrie McLaren. Welcome. Hi. Hi, my name is Heidi Barker. I have a third grader at Bridal Mile and a sixth grader at West Sylvan. Um, it's interesting, but in speaking with my sixth grader this morning about the possibility of him um, going to Wilson and leaving his friends, um, I was basically doing the Wilson cell. Lincoln will be under construction. It's downtown. You know, there's classrooms being held in churches. I'm not from here. I have no allegiance to Lincoln. So quite frankly, I think Wilson in many ways is a better high school. So I was doing the big mommy, hey, this will be great. And the tears started falling into the cereal. And it was, actually, I might like to go to Wilson. That's not what I'm worried about. <sighs> Sorry. I'll cry in public, I don't care. He said, what I'm worried about is the two years before then, and how am I gonna fit in at a school where everything is Lincoln? And he's one of 23 kids in sixth grade who will be asked to leave and go to Wilson. Now, if it were a choice, if we put it as a choice, you guys can choose to go to Wilson or Lincoln. There's 23 of them. Some of those kids are gonna go on to Jesuit, St. Mary's. Some of those kids aren't even gonna to go to Lincoln. Some of them would choose Wilson, maybe even my child. But to go to those 23 kids and the 26 seventh graders and say, we're sorry, but you don't belong here. But you're gonna stay here for the next two, one or two years and then go to a different high school. If you go to the website, there's Lincoln Cardinals track and field, Lincoln youth soccer, Lincoln Cardinal football, Lincoln lacrosse, Lincoln Cardinals basketball, Lincoln girls volleyball, dance team, which performs at Lincoln, the choir, which is a class you can take, which performs at Lincoln, the constitution team, the speech and debate team, all of these things are rooted in Lincoln. They're Lincoln Cardinals. I, I went to the bus stop today, I walked with my son, I saw four kids and they were all wearing, in my Bridal Mile neighborhood, Lincoln Cardinal sweatshirts. 
please consider the small number of kids that are currently there and allow them to choose if they want to the 23 and the 26 kids to continue on to Lincoln, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, members of the board, Superintendent Smith. My name is Carrie McLaren. I'm the parent of a third grader, a uh, third grade boy at Chapman Elementary. Um, I'm going to limit my remarks to Chapman and to uh, the future long-term growth because I'm candidly not qualified to speak as the gentleman before me from Ainsworth Spanish Immersion about the whole West Side proposal. I leave that to your capable hands. Um, but as the mother of a child who, who stopped wanting to have lunch because the lines were too long and he would miss recess, we need to do something about our neighborhood schools now. Um, I was going to not be emotional about it until she started, so. <laughs> oh, I'm fine, I'm fine. I will just, I will just say that. Yeah. It's, it's a very, so, uh, thank you. So these are, I mean, these are obviously deeply emotional issues for parents, um, and our Chapman School is divided, so I'm throwing away part of my testimony because out of respect for our PTA and mem many members of our school community who are really upset about the Ramona move, about, about dual drop-off for their children, about the lack of ability and the delay of those children entering um, or integrating into a larger um, elementary school community, it's critical that the board commit funding as proposed in the superintendent's recommendation to address the administrative and logistical needs to make this transition be smooth and to make the ed educational opportunities be equal. I would add there's a transportation piece that I think is not noted in those recommendations that, that needs to be considered as well. Um, I will chime in in my last 30 seconds probably about the need to do long-term planning um, for growth in the inner west side and for the Portland Public School district as a whole. It's an area that I actually have a fair amount of criticism for the school board of not being connected with TriMet, not being connected um, with the city of Portland in terms of its planning. I'm delighted, however, to see those recommendations on page 22 of the superintendent's recommendation and would ask that, the com the, ask that this board double down, make, take a re make a resolution or a commitment that our community can see that you really are looking at the long-term growth patterns and the need for connectivity with transportation and land use planning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Jorge Raposo and Jen Witten. Hello, good evening. My name is George Raposo, and my fault, not anyone else, is that we were supposed to coordinate that I would come with my daughter. She just spoke, but we'll still keep it to two minutes. Um, our plea is about the family. Um, families nowadays are very different, but the one piece about families that, that is still the same is the siblings. And we moved to the neighborhood to have access to the IB program. My son, who is sitting beside me, uh, speaks of the Cardinals. Um, we would like to keep the family feeling together. Um, so we would uh, very much like to see the greater concept of grandfathering where we can keep families together to be applied. I think if you do that, you would uh, uh, resolve a lot of the frustration and the uh, feelings and the emotions uh, if we can make this transition a little bit longer and so that you can accommodate uh, families to go through the same school system. Um, in addition to that, we live close to the bus stop. Uh, it's a 20-minute ride to uh, the current high school Lincoln versus what it would be probably twice as much to West Sylvan. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, my name is Jennifer Witten and um, I hope that when I tell you where I'm not from, you don't put your head down on the table, but I am from Bridal Mile and um, I think there's the reason why there's so many of us is because it's a it's, a, it's the community that has had been affected the most on the west side in terms of scenarios shifting in and out. Um, 
but I have been the parent representative um, for the families living on the, in West Slope and the larger northern boundary for the past couple of months, and I've sat here before as well. Um, so I've tried to guide my advocacy around just your two basic principles, which is um, the safest, most efficient route for elementary, middle, and high schools, and for all of our schools to have healthy enrollment, which I think of as the Goldilocks school, not too big, not too small. Um, and so in doing so, I've tried to advocate because of this for a continued dual assignment, um, as well as reassignment to another school so that the larger needs of our community could be met. Um, regarding the first principle, so our children in West Slope travel to Bridal Mile on a bus route that begins at 7-Eleven, and for some, for an 8.05 start time. Um, but our children walk to middle and high school, middle school, and then the current TriMet to Lincoln is approximately about 20 minutes. So I think this meets the first criteria of a safe and efficient route to schools. Um, and then, as well, um, we also advocating for a just right school. And so when our community was moved out in scenario 2B, it left Bridal Mile really under-enrolled. And so we do want these schools to be healthy and have that healthy enrollment. Um, our community was willing to change to a different school. We still would be. That's the, what would be the closest school. But in the scenarios that came forth afterwards, um, West Slope was not moved to Ainsworth. And that, as we all know, was a larger problem in programming. and. Um, so the, oh, the first scenario put forth by, um, by Superintendent Smith had our neighborhood included in the Wilson cluster, and this extended travel time goes against my first principle of safe and efficient ways to travel at school. Um, it was at this time that I surveyed the members of the West Slope and the North of Patton families who stated overwhelmingly that we would support the split feeder. 101 families who took the survey, 98.2% supported the split feeder in order to have a safe and efficient way to school. A split allows these two guiding principles to be met, a safe and efficient route to school and bridal mile right sized. If our previous <laughs> request for dual assignment or reassignment to go unheard, then we do support this recent proposal that allows us to continue on to West Sylvan and Lincoln. We support this transition whether we move to Ainsworth or remain at Bridal Mile with a, a separation. Um, again, I've always tried to continue to support the larger Bridal Mile community. I think there's still work left to be done with the middle schools in the southwest portion of Portland, Robert Gray and Jackson. Um, I just want to say one more thing that came up yesterday, and this is because it, this is about science. So whatever the bond work that is done to support the STEM program at Roosevelt, I wholeheartedly support because at some point the boundary issue is going to become something in the past, but what we have to focus on most is what our students are learning at school, and STEM is the most effective way to actually create equity in our schools. So I'll be back on that topic. Thank you. Thank you. You, had, you had to put on your science teacher hat. Next, we have Martina Phillips and Allison Gash. Great. And we do have a lot of speakers, so um, when the red light comes on, please uh, wrap it up so other, other, others can come. Hi. Thank you. Welcome. Hi. I'm Martina Phillips, and I have a third grader in Bridal Mile and sixth grader in West Selvan. I live in West Slope. I am the one who took the 71 minute bus ride from West Slope to Wilson. Most of you heard the story in Robert Gray. I would like to thank Carol Smith for hearing me out and saving our West Slope families from, ma for, from many hours of commuting, my children from walking on outsafe roads with no sidewalks and transferring buses in downtown in the dark. It was a wise decision welcomed by all my neighbors and friends and the only one that makes sense. In, it is interesting how such a simple thing as morning commute to school can change your quality of life. For my neighbors, dual income families, the home and apartment renters, the outreach families, the single moms struggling to get the children to the bus stop, one minute in the morning is like an hour in the afternoon. So that 71 minutes would make our lives very difficult. As a Veslo community, we would like to ask the school board members to support this decision and keep West Slope with West Sylvan and Lincoln. The superintendent's proposal, it, as it stands now, satisfied our needs for safety and reasonable transit time to and from high school. As much as we feel for Bridal Mile Strong and are happy for our elementary school to get right size, we cannot support our geographically challenged neighborhood going to Robert Gray and Wilson because it is simply not safe and too far to go. 
It's been a long process and I want to thank all involved for trying to make our schools better and recognizing the value in education. Thank you. Um, I'm here today as a member of Maplewood 2020, a group of parents representing the Maplewood community during these boundary proceedings. Uh, we want to thank you again for putting us. You want to state your name for the record? Oh, Alison Gash. Sorry about that. I am Maplewood 2020. That's it. Um, we want to thank you again for permitting us to provide feedback um, and are especially appreciative of the most recent set of recommendations from Superintendent Smith, um, but also want to provide a little bit of feedback to the school board in the hopes of um, resolving this process. Um, first, Maplewood really appreciates having the option to attend Hayhurst. As you well know, we are over-enrolled, having surpassed 30 students in quite a few of our classrooms. Um, the results of a recent survey suggest that quite a few of our families would actually be interested in exploring Hayhurst, um, and so we think this will provide some relief to them as well. Um, second, we are glad to see um, that we've retained grandfathering um, as an option. Um, grandfathering our students and their siblings is really the only way to preserve uh, educational and emotional stability. So we really appreciate that, appreciate that as well. And finally, we're also happy to remain at Gray. Uh, we've surveyed our families on a couple of occasions regarding their middle school preferences. Um, most recently, among families who stayed at a preference, the majority would like to remain at Gray. Um, however, as my children like to say, we want more. Um, we don't want a lot more, but we want one tiny um, added uh, recommend, uh, added addition. Uh, we want to give our families the option to attend Jackson through volunteer transfers. 25% uh, of the families we surveyed stayed at a preference for Jackson, and overwhelmingly that preference was tied to concerns about overcrowding at Robert Gray. We want to give those families who have borne the brunt of Maplewood's overcrowding the option for more space if they so choose. We also want to push for fewer 11th hour decisions in any um, <coughs> future boundary proceedings, um, such as those involving the reopening of Smith, which we wholeheartedly endorse. Um, in specific, we would like to have a committee comprised of the families most likely to feed into Smith as a committee. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Next, we have Karen Cohen and Brad Nelson. Welcome. Thank you. I'm Karen Cohen, um, and I thank you very much for allowing me the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, it's already been discussed most of what I was going to talk about, and that is about allowing the sixth and seventh graders that are currently at West Sylvan to continue on to Lincoln because of their immersion into everything spirited by Lincoln. Um, but I also wanted to add in that according to the Student Assignment Review and School Boundary Changes, which is Form 4.10.049-AD, Part 5, which is the School Boundary Change Considerations, B, 1, Stable Feeder Pattern, states in A, allow as many students possible to continue together from one school level to the next, and in 6, which is the limited impact on students, Part C, Avoid separating small number of students from their classmates when they move to a school at the next level. I believe that it would be fair to allow current West Sylvan students to continue with the cohorts and by doing so meet the standards as stated in the administrative directive. Um, secondly, and lastly, um, I just wanted to touch on the idea that Robert Gray, which is a wonderful opportunity for my fourth grader, since I have a fourth grader as well as a seventh grader in West Sylvan, the opportunity to attend Robert Gray, but I am concerned about how crowded it's going to become. I don't believe that Robert Gray can handle the influx of students from Hayhurst, Maplewood, Bridal Mile, and Reiki. So um, if you could please take another look at that and see what you can do about perhaps using Jackson, as was mentioned, as a school for some of the students that would be also attending Robert Gray, that would be appreciated. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, thank you. My name is Brad Nelson. I'm a Bridal Mile parent. Over the last several months, our community has attempted to explain to DBRAC and PPS staff that we have not asked to be a split feeder at Bridal Mile Elementary. I'll repeat this since somehow it is getting lost in translation that we like a split feeder. Bridal Mile Elementary has not asked to be a split feeder elementary. 
We have advocated for dual assignment, and I continue to think that dual assignment would work. We have sent multiple documents to PPS staff showing that this will work, and I would ask that you please consider this option. It's amazing after five months that the original map and the current proposal are almost identical. What has happened is that the process has listened to angry parents throughout the district complain, and things have changed <coughs> and gone back. There's been shirts. There's been people complaining. The problem is that this proposal is not sustainable. This proposal temporarily alleviates crowding at Chapman, but overcrowds West Silphon and Grade Middle Schools. Bridal Mile especially is in the middle of everything, and will almost certainly have to endure another boundary change in three or less years. This is ridiculous. PBS staff that have said that they look forward to the opportunity to do more boundary changes more often should not be happy. Neither should parents. As a responsible school board, you should be looking at the long-term health and viability of the Portland Public School District. Come up with something that is sustainable, not something that you are going to tinker with every other year. Look to solve overclouding in the Lincoln Cluster at its source by considering to shift kids in both the Pearl District and South Waterfront east of the river to schools that need and can use enrollment. Treat PPS as one school district rather than an east district and a west district. Please make sound decisions that will last and treat everyone fairly. And most in short, importantly, do not show preference for some schools over others. One of the biggest concerns that I have is that there's a bond this fall. You've angered a lot of parents over this entire process. I would ask that you consider this and please do something that is what you should do. Look to, for the long-term success of this school district. Thank you for your time. Our next two speakers, Brett Corrick and Graham Schweitzer. Welcome. Hi there. I'm Brett Corrick. Um, I'm from Bridemile. <laughs> um, I've been in heavily involved in the Boundary team over the last several months, and I guess what I'm going to try to do is provide an overall perspective, which may be hard considering there are different um, parent perspectives. But from my perspective, there are three possible outcomes for Bridemile, which I'm going to list in order of community preference. First is dual assignment. Second is a new Bridemile school boundary feeding into Gray and Wilson. And third, and only a, as a last resort, should be a split sh feeder should be considered. Dual assignment remains our community's top preference. Please explain why PPS has rejected this option. While not a guarantee, we suspect PPS has underprojected the potential impact of Bridemile dual assignment in relieving Lincoln overcrowding. It's my understanding that 40% of Bridemile fifth graders have opted for gray this next year. As well, 70% of gray 8th graders living in the Bridal Mall neighborhood are opting for Wilson. Our historic trend toward choosing the Wilson cluster continues to grow as it's a fantastic school. Regarding relief for Lincoln, are you clear on what the PPS future enrollment goals are for Lincoln, regarding, um, particularly with, when you consider the new construction? We continue to ask for these numbers and have not been provided a clear answer. Please factor in these Lincoln future enrollment projection numbers when evaluating the merits of split feeder versus dual assignment. If our top choice of dual assignment doesn't get your support, please look at the option where you, can find, where you find a new home for the north of Patton families and create a new Bridemile community feeding into Gray and Wilson. Scenario 2B was a feeble attempt at this as it left Bridemile significantly under-enrolled. If both of these two options are not possible, this is the only point where a split feeder should be considered. With that said, every split feeder scenario proposed for Bridemile has been unprecedented for PPS. For example, a typical split feeder after middle school would divide a student population only 50-50 and sending um, eighth graders to two separate schools, but the superintendent's recommendation isolates very few kids, 10 to 15 percent, after you factor in grandfathering. And this is unfair um, and unjust for those children. So I'm just asking two things moving forward. One is, please do the analysis on dual assignment and look at the current enrollment figures that have just been turned into PPS and prove out that this is not going to help. And also, please consider not having Bridemall be the only school that endures both a cluster shift and a split feeder. 
If the ultimate plan is to move Bridal Mile to the Wilson Cluster, have another elementary school endure a split, a split feeder to relieve crowding at Gray. We understand change is inevitable. We're just asking for a thoughtful solution. Thank you. Uh, my, my name is Graham Schweitzer. I'm a parent of uh, two current children at Hayhurst and one future uh, children at Hayhurst Elementary. I didn't intend to speak tonight, uh, but with uh, so many people from other schools, specifically Bridal Mile talking, I didn't want you to forget about Hayhurst. Um, and the, the thing that sticks out to me is the, um, the, the phrase enrollment balancing. And I, I, I'm flipping through the, the overarching uh, goals, uh, the first bullet point being make specific boundary adjustments that relieve overcrowding or address under enrollment and strengthen programs across the district. <clears throat> and focusing on Hayhurst and, and the area around Hayhurst, I don't know that that, go the, the, that goal is, is, has been achieved. You have an under-enrolled, under, under uh, the superintendent's in, uh, proposal, you have an under-enrolled Hayhurst next to an over-enrolled Maplewood, both of whom are feeding into what will be an over-enrolled uh, Gray. <clears throat> Ms. Gash from, from Maplewood uh, just pointed out to you uh, that they like the option of being able to, to feed into or have the option to go to uh, under-enrolled Jackson Elementary. I think all of these things need to be considered uh, to truly achieve the goals that are laid out in, in this nice pamphlet uh, and frankly, the, uh, the title of this entire process, which is enrollment balancing. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Next we have two students, Sana and Jasmine. Jasmine. Hello. I'm Sonella. And um, we're here from Irvington and we just we just wanted to say that we wanted to say K through eight <laughs> Irvington because we really like it there. <laughs> and all, <laughs> all my friends are there. And if I leave, I won't know anyone. And I just really wanted to stay. <laughs> They've both been in the same class since kindergarten, and they planned on going to middle school together, so that's why it's kind of emotional for them. So um, we know that it's a tough decision that you guys have to make, but um, we're just asking, just consider all the children at schools, you know, that to remain a K through eight, that way they can continue their educational journey together. Thank you for catching Thank Jasmine by. and Sana. What grade are you guys in now? Um, fifth. fifth. Yeah. So it really affects them. Thank you guys, Thank Thank you guys very much. <laughs> Our next two speakers are Darian Gulutunya and Heather Saul. Those two young ladies are classmates, actually, of my daughter. My name is Heather Saul. Um, my daughter, Charlotte, is in the fifth grade at Irvington. Uh, as with many families, uh, the issue is hitting very close to home for us. We have been discussing DBRAC uh, around the dinner table. And what has consistently come up for us and for her is that she loves Irvington. It's a good school. She's gone there for over half of her life. She knows the teachers and staff, and they know her. She loves that she can walk to school. Uh, in fact, this week she started walking to school unaccompanied. And uh, crossing 21st and 15th by herself was a really huge accomplishment for her because I haven't let her do that yet <laughs> until Monday because I can't walk her to school by, my, by myself now because I'm on crutches. <laughs> uh, 
And at that point when we were having a conversation, she started talking about the facilities and how much she loves the gym and music class and the playground. And then I was just like, okay, moving on, kid. <laughs> and as a parent, what I love about Irvington is the community, the familiarity of it, that we truly are a family at the school, that Irvington teaches inclusion, not exclusion, that I've been able to volunteer with Arnerich Messina and in helping children better themselves through reading and math and their skills for five years. And even though my daughter placed out over two years ago, the kids I tutored still talk to me and they call me by name. And while I'm sure the school board has taken, you know, has great ideas for making Tubman a fully functioning middle school within the next year, I feel fear that the children who will be entering the seventh grade in 2017 could fall through the cracks. Additionally, the distance for the children who will be funneled there from feeder schools, has that been considered? We live on 21st. I wouldn't in a million years let my daughter walk or ride her bike to Tubman as she'd not only be crossing 15th, but MLK and Williams, and she'd be going through an industrial area. And it's, I'm responsible for getting her to school. And I also have a stepdaughter who goes to MLC. And if, when my husband is working, if he can't get his daughter to school, one of our kids is going to be late or one of them is going to be really early. So that's a problem in itself. And I know a lot of other parents who have stepchildren will be facing that as well. So thank you very much. <laughs> so. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so committee members, thank you for your time. My name is Dorian Gualatunia. I'm here uh, representing Astor Elementary. Um, pretty much what you just said is what yeah. uh, a lot of our uh, community here feels. Um, you know, I'll be bold to say specifically talking about uh, North Portland. I think, to be honest with you, North Portland is better served leaving schools as is. Uh, the reason being is because of a demographic shift from my perspective. That area is changing rapidly. Um, you see it every day. Um, it's one of the last pockets in Portland proper that's still somewhat affordable, and you see more and more families moving in. Um, I think for that, uh, uh, I think the, a lot of the changes that are being um, brought forward are really short-sighted, to be honest with you. I think my biggest fear as a parent is in three years, uh, PPS is going to look at the boundaries and say, wait, why don't we just go back to what we did, and hence just taking a big old swipe and, and redoing the wheel when they didn't need to. Uh, specifically about Aster, um, it's gone through a, some incredible growth as a school and as a greater community. Uh, it's, a, it's a place that families are very invested in and support each other day by day. Uh, I truly feel that Aster would be um, severely hampered by some of the changes that are going on. My biggest fear is that a number of families are going to leave PPS, to be honest with you, mm -hmm. and go into private schools. As a parent and as a community member, that's actually the last thing I want to do, but it is an option that we talk about a lot in our family. Um, excuse me. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the changes could really greatly undermine the wider Portland community. So it's not just an Astor problem. I think it's a Cesar Chavez problem, and I think it's also a, um, I'm sorry, I'm losing my train of thought here, but uh, it's also a George problem as well. I think North Portland's thriving, and I think the structure as is is working. It's not perfect, but I think a number of families are very invested and they want to see it work. Um, I humbly just consider that you guys take a look at what you're proposing for North Portland and please leave it as is. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Next we have Liv Cruz and Greg Sanders. I'm going first. My name is Greg Sanders. I'm a parent from Irvington. The proposal presented to you yesterday will leave most of the most underserved schools virtually unchanged while dismantling successful K-8 programs like Irvington and leaving Chapman and Cleary, Cleary still painfully overcrowded. As you've heard uh, tonight, many of us here are deeply concerned with the plan before you. And before coming to you, PPS held community meetings on the west side and east side, and unlike tonight, those meetings were standing room only. There were some testimonies on the west side in support of the current proposal, but on the east side, as the previous person just said, the disapproval was almost unanimous. Parents complained that the under-enrolled, underperforming schools like King and George were being ignored by the district, while successful community schools like Irvington, Sabin, and Vernon were being rearranged at no apparent value. The parents from Cleary 
complained that their overcrowded condition would remain unchanged, and, and a parent from King made an impassioned plea to PPS to shut down her school rather than allow it to remain in its un current underserved condition. Hearing this powerful testimony united the Eastside community members to standing ovation. As you know, the framework of the DBRAC focuses on three core values, equity, access, and environment. And over the past decade, the <laughs> Irvington community has worked hard to develop a neighborhood school that we believe embodies the district's aspirations and reflects our community's values. I'm here representing Irvington community, and if you approve the current PPS plan and break up our successful K-8 program, here's what you will be dismantling. One of the most diverse enrollments in the PPS system, an enriched curriculum serving the needs of a wide range of children, a strong, safe community con and continuity for our children during the often difficult middle school years, progress in closing achievement gaps, and unique programs that reach into the middle school grades, including SWIFT, Learning in Depth, and Maurice Lucas Sports Academy. The one-size-fits-all proposal in front of you is not the right solution for Portland Public Schools, and the board member and the board should demand better. Rather than convert Irvington to K-5, Irvington should be preserved as a K-8 model of what it means to grow strong schools and create strong communities. We are united in this goal and urge you to join us in maintaining Irvington as a K-8 for the benefit of our community and the district as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Leave Cruz, and my husband Viola and I spoke a few weeks ago at the Hosford listening session. And as um, Greg talked about, the, it was heartbreaking to listen to the stories that school after school presented from our east side um, about the educational opportunities that their kids do not have. Um, and as Greg said, there are many schools that are not working, but Irvington is serving all of our students, and we believe it should not be dismantled. My husband and I are a biracial couple, and we have three sons, two kindergartners and a third grade student. We chose Irvington because high expectations are the norm and the avenues to achieve it are clear. We chose Irvington because our boys need to sit in classrooms with kids who not only look like them, but also represent the world in which we live. Like our friends who surround us today, we chose Irvington because it is diverse and has great teachers. By reconfiguring our school, you will dramatically alter the faces and experiences for our entire student body, and especially from our boys. When PPS initially announced their desire to move away from the K-8 model, we were open to the idea. So we explored what Irvington's middle level had to offer so we could make an informed decision. I was biased against the K-8 model. I have 18 years experience as a middle school teacher, and I believe in the middle school model. But Irvington has something special happening simply because it is a K-8. We discovered our middle level students participate in an impressive set of challenging and culturally relative electives. For example, every opening Wednesday, our students choose from a wide variety of service learning opportunities, giving back to the Portland community at large while learning about social justice. Our middle level students push in as reading tutors and mentors every single day. Through these and a host of other supports at school, our students are on the path to becoming the next generation of community leaders. Did you know that last year's third grade double scores did not have an achievement gap? None. Let me repeat that. Race was not an indicator of how well a student would perform on reading tests. What's more, the students in those classrooms were 53% students of color. Clearly, Irvington is serving the needs of the students that you are in charge of educating and I would just plead with you to not break up what we have working. The K-8 needs to stay intact in order for all of those programs to run efficiently. Um, our model is something that needs to be repli replicated and not dismantled. As a beacon school for courageous conversations, our teachers have been trained to, to support our diverse student body. These scores are a direct result of the community of teachers who have worked hard to create change in a system that has not historically served my children well. All of our students need to stay at Irvington so the work and investment our teachers have made can continue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next two speakers are Julie Davis and Stuart McCormick. opportunity. Yeah. Um, no. 
want me to start? Sure. My name is Stuart McCornack, and I live in the northern peninsula of the Bridal Mile School District. Uh, I am here uh, sort of at the 11th hour. I have not been as engaged in this process as, as I normally would. Um, and I'd like, before I, I make my comments, I'd like to say two things. One, I hope I'm speaking to a board made up of compassionate educators rather than administrators. I think that's a very important thing for us to consider. And I, I truly hope that's the case. I know all of you have not been teachers, but some of you have been parents, some of you have been educators. This is a painful process for many, many people in this room. Um, second, I'd just like to say that I agree with many, if not all of the comments that have been made on behalf of the Bridal Mile District. We have a lot of people here that are speaking, but my comments are gonna concern safety and time travel. Um, as you've heard, the bus ride for some of our students that, will, that are north of Dosh that will be going to high school at Wilson, um, it's gonna take a long time for those kids to get to school and get home. If you told, just at the bare minimum, over five days of, uh, of, of school, it's at least five hours of travel to and from Wilson for many of these families. And we're not talking about a huge number of families. It, it, it's not gonna have a tremendous impact on Wilson or, or Lincoln. Um, I think the real number is more like seven hours, eight hours, and at the end of a school day, Certainly at particular times of the year, the safety concerns are gonna kick in because those kids, many of those kids are gonna be transferring back onto the Canyon bus in the middle of the night in downtown Portland. I think that that is a huge issue for you guys to consider. Um, so that's really what I have to say. Certainly I can elaborate on that after this meeting is over, but that's where I'm coming from. Thank you very much. So, <clears throat> hello, my name is Julie Davis. I'm back. <laughs> I spoke at the Hosford meeting uh, recently, the listening circle that was there, and I wrote an op-ed in the Oregonian, and it specifically concerns King's plight. I am a parent of a fifth grader at King's School, um, but before I tell you a little bit about that, I'm gonna open with a little bit about me. So I have been a teacher for the past 17 years. I teach in a high school in another district. And every year at the last day, I always, we always have a big conversation with the students and we say our cheerful goodbyes. And I always say this, you know, I'm your junior year high school teacher and I always will be that. And my door is always open. You know, you just have this one year at junior English and I hope that you loved it because I loved having you as a student. And that's why I'm here is because students really only get one year um, at any grade level and that's the problem. Um, there's a fix for King, but it is a year away. And that year to us seems long, but to a student that is their entire middle school experience for sixth grade, seventh grade, or eighth grade. And it's particularly dire at King. Um, so King School currently, um, I always feel embarrassed to follow Irvington, has um, <laughs> no extracurricular options to choose from. There are none. There are a few specials that the district has gone out of its way to provide, but there are no options that the kids can choose. There's no compacted math. We're the only middle school option in the entire district that has no accelerated math for excellent math students, and there are excellent math students at King School. Um, there are, there are no, um, there's nothing there for the kids. It's just too, too under-enrolled. So here's what we're going to ask you. Please listen to our proposal. We are currently in the process of gathering. We're, we've talked to King parents. We've talked to administrators at King School. We're talking to other schools in our community. We are composing a proposal that we ask that you just listen to and consider seriously because it needs serious consideration and it's needed it for years and I think you know that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Jason Blumklotz and Heather Kent. It's 
been a while. Um, good evening, my name is Jason Blumklotz. I'm an Irvington father. I have a fourth and sixth grader there. I'm a lifelong resident of Northeast Portland, I'm a proud alum of Irvington and the very first sixth grade cohort at Harriet Tubman Middle School in 1983. I want to share the personal impact of the superintendent's reconfiguration recommendations. My family moved to Irvington in 1972. We moved there because of our family situation. My sister, a beautiful biracial girl who we adopted at eight weeks old, my brother and I needed a community that reflected her as well as her older brothers. And we found great joy in the endless diversity there and prospered at that school. Today, many of the families at Irvington could tell the same story of finding a home for their diverse families. We remain a culturally diverse mix despite Irvington's sometimes Tony reputation. We're 40% kids of color, 27% free and reduced lunch. The superintendent's plan would dramatically alter the demographic makeup of our school. If we lose 150 middle school, middle school students, leaving us with just 350 K-5ers, where will the students to create a robust elementary come from? Most likely from our neighbors to the east, who are whiter and wealthier. Overnight, we become less than 10% students of color. This would be a disaster for our community. Some have blithely said to us, well, gentrification is coming anyway. And to that we say, when we have a choice, let's not choose more displacement. The other impact would be to lose a great school seeking to be greater. We had a failed middle school for many years. We only retained 20% of our students. And we, together with our staff, our <coughs> administrator, were able to turn that around by focusing on elective choice models and getting good teachers in there. I could go on for a long time, but we don't have a lot of time. But I just want to say that I know this every day, every week, every month, every year, we are working to provide the best public education for our community. We humbly ask that you celebrate us while keeping us a K-8. And lastly, I want to say, make no mistake, we want a great education for all children. We support the creation of a new middle school at Tubman. We will work with Saban, Boise Elliott Humboldt, and King to ensure that Tubman is great no matter what our configuration is. We believe that both a strong K-8 Irvington and Tubman Middle School are possible. Let's come together to make that happen. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Great, good evening. I'm Heather Nelson Kent, and I, uh, I'm the PTA president at Access Academy. And um, I know the recommendation from the superintendent is not to move Access until 2017. We'd really like to support the proposal to move Access to Humboldt. But until we see the building and really understand whether or not that facility meets our program needs, it's gonna be hard for us to support that. We think we could get this decision made and settled, but we really um, wanna understand, and there has been no information uh, for the parent community about the facility or when we'll know more about what the program has to offer there. Um, we do we are happy to see the recommendation from the superintendent to consider growth for access. We have over 170 kids on our waiting list. These are qualified students that deserve to have their needs met by the program that access offers. We also were happy to see the superintendent's recommendation not to assign access yet to a high school program. We have been working with our site council and the district to make recommendations about what type of a high school program access needs. It is chartered as a K through 12 program by the district. Currently, we are only serving K through eight students. Um, our site council's put together a lot of recommendations uh, about what needs our high school students have, and so we are happy to see the recommendation change to wait on that proposal until um, that educational assessment and those un uh, better understanding of how high schools could meet the needs of our students um, have been reviewed more thoroughly. So um, we stand ready to support the move to Humboldt, but we really need more information and uh, would appreciate um, uh, follow-up from the staff or whomever so that we can get into that building, get a look at it, We've been moved once before without seeing the inside of the building, and we'd really like to see it soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can, can, I, can, can, I also, can I also thank Karen for moving Jazzy and Sanaa up? So they really appreciate that. Thank you. 
uh, our next two speakers, Mary Sanatori, and it looks like um, Jay Meyer. Welcome. Hi, should I go? Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hello, PPS concerned parents and families and teachers and staff and PPS board members. <coughs> My name is Mary Senatori and I live in Irvington. I have a fourth grader at Irvington and she's been there since um, pre-K, so for six years. And she and my husband and I love our neighborhood school. And I'm here today to implore the PPS board to keep Irvington K through eight. Frankly, I never thought that I would be up here because I could never have imagined that the school board would propose to dismantle a highly successful neighborhood school Irvington K-8 is successful both academically and socially. It currently meets the school board's stated goals regarding equity, access, and environment. From an equity standpoint, Irvington K-8 school boasts one of the most diverse student populations of any PPS school, with 42% of its students coming from underserved populations. That students of color, econo economically disadvantaged students, um, special education students and English language learners. Irvington is a Swiss school where special ed students are not siloed but rather mainstreamed with their grade level counterparts, thereby producing better academic and social outcomes for all students. From an access standpoint, Irvington K-8 offers a rich and diverse curriculum that meets the needs of all our children at, the, at all grade levels. Much of this has been developed over the last several years through the tireless and focused work of teachers, staff, parents, and community members. Our school delivers a rich set of electives and resources equal or better than most traditional middle schools. Additionally, there is a wealth of after-school programs from chess to music to drumming, as well as partnerships with the Morris, Maurice Lucas Foundation and Arnrich Messina that provide both academic and leadership building programs. All of, the, all of the above has resulted in year-over-year -year progress in closing achievement gaps. From an environment standpoint, Irvington K-8 is already right size in terms of optimizing enrollment to the building capacity. Furthermore, the K-8 configuration enables Irvington students to become strong mentors, role models, leaders, through con the continuity, stability, and accountability that is created by blending grade school students with middle school students. This is a learning opportunity in and of itself and is not replicable in a middle school configuration. Furthermore, the negative and risky behaviors that accompany middle school only schools are absent at Irvington. In summary, in terms of academic, <coughs> behavioral, and community outcomes, Irvington K-8 through is the gold standard to which all Portland public schools should aspire regardless of configuration. Um, it seems to me that the board is uh, ideologically biased towards a K-8 through model as a means to achieve their end of meeting uh, their stated equity, access, and environment goals, but this end has already been achieved at Irvington. Can I have a few more minutes or, or seconds? I, well, I, I would just say... If um, you could wrap it up, that'd be great. Okay, so please don't take a cookie-cutter approach to solving a nuanced problem. I understand that this is no easy task, and I understand that there are schools within PPS that have significant problems in addressing academic underperformance, and quite frankly, I was appalled and heartbroken a few weeks ago to hear some of the stories about PPS's broken schools, especially George Middle School. These children, all of Portland's children, deserve a dignified quality education <sighs> that prepares them to be productive, functional members of our community. Please don't steal from Peter to pay Paul. Please don't dismantle and ruin a great neighborhood school. Please preserve one of the shining examples of success within PPS. Irv please keep Irvington K through eight, a K through eight school. Thank you. Thank you. Our next two speakers are Bill Cunningham and Tina Oliver. Hello, my name is Bill Cunningham. I live in the Grant Park neighborhood. I have two daughters who attend the Beverly Cleary School. One's a 
an eighth grader and others a fifth grader. They may not be affected by a lot of these changes, but uh, I do want to relate uh, my perspective on things because I do believe that uh, what the, the configuration in Beverly Cleary has worked very well for my uh, daughters and would like to continue those opportunities into the future. I do acknowledge and realize that a lot of schools do not have the, the broad range of options that are needed for a successful, I think, school experience. Many people do not, or students do not have the broad range of sciences, arts, and languages that some of the middle schools do provide. And I think in, generally I support the idea of providing more middle school options for more schools. I think it provides uh, students with options and choices they need to succeed in school. However, I also believe that these options are also things that should apply to school communities. Um, if I interpret uh, the superintendent's uh, recommendation, it, it appears that there is some room for places like Beverly Cleary if uh, a K-8 through model does not negatively impact the arrangements of grade schools, middle schools uh, in the surrounding areas, that it provides some opportunity for a continuation of that model. And uh, if so, I'm, I'm a little bit unclear about uh, the status of Bill Beverly Cleary. I generally support that idea of providing that option. Uh, I really do think it works. I was concerned about some scenarios that would have uh, closed the elementary school in the area and had everyone go south of the freeway, which uh, being a school that has high portions of people walking and biking to school would totally destroy that neighborhood school experience. So generally I support the idea of options that the middle school model provides, but I, I don't think it should be an orthodoxy which provides no flexibility for uh, local school uh, uh, perspectives and choices. Good evening and thank you for this opportunity to speak. My name is Tina Oliver and I'm a parent at Hayhurst Elementary School. I have a third grader there and I have a three-year-old who will be there in a few short years. So I'll be there for about a decade. I'm invested in the long run, needless to say. So um, for Hayhurst, we'd like to thank um, the piece of the superintendent's uh, proposal that moves Odyssey for this fall. Hayhurst is stuck between a rock and a hard place. If nothing happens, we would have been severely over-enrolled next year. As soon as Odyssey leaves, we're very under-enrolled. There's a significant amount of anxiety right now amongst our parents at our school. We're very concerned that we're going to show up this fall and we're not going to have any of our special enrichment programs because our school is <laughs> under-enrolled. The projected numbers you have for Hayhurst for this fall put our facility utilization at something like 70% and our numbers in the low 300s. Our three neighboring schools have plenty of kids and they also have plenty of money to be frank. We have a much higher percentage of lower income families who attend Hayhurst. We consider this diversity part of the experience of going to Hayhurst. We wouldn't trade it for anything. We value diversity and we we know that the experience we get from this is worth more than money. At the same time, we don't have the same fundraising capacity of our neighborhood schools. We just don't. We don't have a foundation. We don't have the ability to raise a lot of money and fund FTEs. We're very concerned if we show up in the fall, our technology teacher might not be there. Perhaps we'll lose our beloved PE teacher because if he goes down to half time, he might have to find a different position. He's been with us for more than a decade. And it doesn't seem fair. Equity is one of the things that you guys have said is part of this process. If it turns out that our four little schools, three of them are well funded with kids <coughs> and plenty of money and this one in the middle is not, and it's actually the school with most of the lower income kids, which we're serving very well by the way, and we're very proud of that, it just doesn't seem fair. So we would actually like that in writing if you could. Let us know what the plan is if that happens this fall. There's a lot of anxiety amongst our parents. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have one more person signed up to testify. I can't quite read the name. Could it possibly be Kaiser as the last name? Did anyone else sign up and not? testified yet? <laughs> no, All right, would anybody else like to testify? Um, I did, but can I just, oh, sorry. Um, 
I'm Laura Burchard, and um, I have students at MLC, but I live in St. John's. And if you draw a line down the center of the city, the river is not the line. St. John's residents are some of the most westernly of the city. And so I would like to actually speak out for George Middle School. I don't know if you've heard anyone testify on behalf of George Middle School. I think that the current plan doesn't serve its needs. I think leaving two feeder schools, um, I mean, I, I've heard a lot of passion pleas for preserving K-8s, and I believe in the K-12 model personally. Um, but I just, my heart breaks for those kids. They're my neighbors, they're my friends. And I just ask that something be done for the under-enrolled middle schools that are, it's just status quo, and um, it breaks my heart to go through this process um, and have those kids remain underserved. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and you, you want to say something? Yes. Yeah. I just want to finish out the Hayhurst testimony. Um, after saying we support middle schools for the Jefferson cluster. Um, regarding the right sizing for Hayhurst, we wanted to add that we have 22 classrooms. That's enough for a school that could, can hold a solid three-strand elementary school with upwards of 450 children, unlike the th uh, low 300s that are currently assigned to it. This preferred enrollment model for PPS and we would like to see it apply to our school. The current proposal comes nowhere near it, not even by 2020. So I would like to see, we would like to see that address. Thank you. Okay. All right, well thank you everybody for testifying. It's very helpful for us to hear um, as we've heard testimony throughout this process. So appreciate that. And the next um, public hearing on this process, you, you wanna come and? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, then I'll, then we'll close it up. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Welcome. I appreciate the time that you guys have taken. Go ahead and state your name and then. Oh, I'm Sarah Gage Smith. Okay. And anything else you want me to say? No. Okay. So I appreciate the time. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Okay, yes. Um, so I appreciate the time that you've, actually this is a long process several months um, with committees and public hearings, so I appreciate the time um, and involving the public. Um, so I'm a parent at um, Access Academy, which serves, has traditionally served uh, underserved population, tag kids, and it's been, it's been moving on from location to location. And so right now it's currently at Rose City Park, which is, I believe, is more centrally located. So I would, recommend or my opinion would be to keep the school where it's at um, right now I think under the proposals to move it to um, the north part of Portland um, which for my I mean for my daughter will involve an over an hour bus ride um, and at the school that's being proposed it has a small playground and one of the reasons for movement is to allow growth for the program and I understand that physically it doesn't really have that much room so, um, and we ended up as parents choosing the, I mean, we we're like, our daughter got into the program and we had to make a choice to move her out of a neighborhood school or go to this program and we liked the location. So we ended up making the choice on that. And eventually we may end up having to make another choice if it's, she ends up taking long bus rides. So um, I guess I would just personally, um, We'd rather have access remain where it's at and supported by the Portland Public School District and not have it continue to move from one location to another. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you everybody. And um, our, our second hearing on this, um, on the boundary will be uh, April 5th at 5 p.m. in this building. So appreciate you coming, very appreciative.